welcome back to Season 5 of the Changing Earth Podcast with Sarah F. Hathaway. Blending survival fiction and fact to bring you entertaining education that will help you dream, survive, and thrive. And now, here's your host, Sarah F. Hathaway. Hello and welcome back to the Changing Earth Podcast. I'm happy to have you back with me today. This is episode number 173. Season 5, episode 10. So, last week was my absolute favorite, uh, well, uh, one of my favorite chapters of this book. It was, you know, my favorite early chapter, we'll put it that way. And uh, people either really liked it or, you know, uh, my editor was cute. She was like, whoa, that's a little violent for me. She's, you know, she's she's a cute gal that helps me out. And uh, these books are kind of out of her uh, normal read area, I guess, but... You know, I had a lot of fun with that, and, uh, you know, this book starts going into a few more darker areas, so um, definitely had to reach outside of my comfort zone and uh, had a little fun with that. So it's going to continue that way into the next book. I do have a name picked out for it, and I designed this really cool cover for it, so I'm getting really excited about it. Um, I'm putting the finishing touches on it right now, getting it ready for the editor. Uh, you know, we still have a lot of dark days in Denver left to read. I'm just, uh, um, coursing ahead pretty quickly here. So that book's not actually going to be released till, um, the podcast finishes up its season. It's not going to be officially released. However, my Patreon members are going to get early access to that book pretty much as soon as it's done. There's a specific reason why I'm doing it this way. It's because... Um, the story is, is still going. I'm writing book seven right now and, uh, I just couldn't find basically like a really good end spot for it. So, you know, it climaxes up and then it, it really leaves you hanging. And I got so many comments this last time, like, when's the next book coming out? When's the next book coming out? So I decided I'm going to pause till about the end of the podcast. I should have book six and seven pretty much, you know, able to release back to back at that point, um, within a month or so of each other. And that way I don't have to leave you guys hanging so long. However, if you are a Patreon member, you will be able to get early access to that book basically as soon as it's ready to go. So if you'd like to become a Patreon member, head on over to www.patreon.com backslash changing earth. That's www.patreon.com backslash changing earth to go over there and become a contributor and I very much value all the contributions that everybody makes. It's what keeps the show going, keeps me on the air, keeps me having fun, keeps me educating, entertaining. And, you know, I just see uh, my books going um, down a long road. There's a a bright future ahead for them and I'm just uh, continuing on my course. I'm also continuing on my course of training jujitsu. So I'm finally getting stronger and like able to do more with it. And I got my first like for real submission the other day. And that's awesome being like this little five foot hundred nothing gal who can go out and, uh, you know, submit a 160 pound guy. And, you know, it's pretty cool. So um, my first real success with that, I guess. And I can't really call it a success because it was honestly I was grappling my husband and he doesn't really know what to do and you know so that's pretty cool it's all the same to actually get like the the full submit because usually he's like barely doing anything and I'm like trying as hard as I can to combat him and you know he's just like whatever because he's got the strength so it was really neat to have that success and like I said, the only reason why I share it with you guys is because I hope it encourages you to go and like, you know, my story, you know, that, that training jujitsu has been a different, different road for me, difficult road for me. And, uh, so now to finally have some successes, hopefully that encourages you to go and get outside of your comfort zone and, uh, really try and, and do something new, learn how to defend yourself. Most importantly, just learn how to defend yourself, go take some classes, go, go boxing, whatever you got to do, um, to learn how to do that. Cause once you do, you know, a lot of people that you come up against aren't going to be trained that way. So even if you're just trained in a certain amount of things, like with jujitsu, you know, um, I might not be able to best a lot of the people that I train with because they know the same things that I do. However, when you're out on the street, most people don't know those things. So me having that advantage of the knowledge is going to help out a ton. So that's, that's pretty much my game plan. My hope anyway. 
All right, let's see what we what else we got going. Oh, we got some crazy weather right now. Um, we haven't had rain. We had one rain come in at the beginning of fall. I'm out here in Cali. You know, we had one rain come in at the beginning of fall. And we have been so dry. We've had wind. Um, this show comes out on Tuesday, but um, I was recording on Friday. And that's when we had these fires that started up uh, yesterday, the campfire fire up north by Chico. And then they were even evacuating Malibu and stuff because of fires. This is just absolutely insane. We have just not had a break this year. And uh, I'm just scared that the sky is going to be all smoky and hazy again. And this poor state is just having a rough go at it. So, um, you know, maybe it's karma or something. <laughs> but I don't want to overstep my bounds there because there's, you know, it's a serious thing. There's people that died in these fires and a lot of people lost their homes. And, um, you know, you got to just be ready to evacuate wherever you are in the country. You need to be ready to evacuate in under five minutes because, with some of these disasters, you just can't move fast enough. So you think you have time and you think you're going to be able to, you know, grab things at certain areas and stuff, but really you're not. You need to have it ready to go within five minutes is your goal. So start drilling it, you know, have your go bags ready to go. Know exactly where things are that you're going to bring with you. Important documents are absolutely essential, like your birth certificates, um, credit card information, insurance information, stuff like that. You need to have that all in one location have your go bags ready to go, have any important, like really valuable things that you need to get the heck out of there in a, in a location, you know, your guns, your ammo, things like that has got to go. So, and you need to be able to do that in under five minutes. So whatever it takes for you and your family to develop that plan, you need to be ready. This is, this is serious stuff that we've been facing this year with all these hurricanes. Um, I just see some tornadoes coming in. Uh, this winter, we're going to have, uh, we've got wildfires still going in California. You know, it's just absolutely insanity. So you need to be ready to go. That's what keeps me on my mission. That's what keeps me building prepared communities is because I want everybody ready to go. It's my belief that the more people we can prepare, the more people we can share our ideas with, the more people we can wake up to what is going on with our planet, the less chaos we're going to have when things happen. We have to be a fluid society that can act actively adapt quickly to what's going on. And uh, right now with all, you know, the back and forth BS and all that, it's just not healthy. We're not focusing on the future and how to build prepared communities and how to survive as one people, no matter where we came from, no matter, you know, what our beliefs are and things like that. We're all Americans. We're all believing in red, white, and blue. And that's where we need to be united so that we can be this fluid society that can rapidly adapt to these changes that are going to happen. If we can't do that and we can't hold together, it's gonna, it's not going to be good. So that's why I'm on my mission to, pre pre you know, create these prepared communities that can really go out there and, and help other communities and every person that you prepare, that you help, that you open their eyes, that's one more person adding to that community. That's one more person that's going to be on board. That's one more person that knows what to do. That's one more person that's going to have food. I mean, if everybody was doing this, we would not really have a problem. Uh, the problem is within the individual, you know, we did that whole episode last week with Jim Cobb on how to handle this conflict management, how to do that. Well, that's something we can employ every day. So we need to be handling these conflicts so that we can help other people to understand why this is so important. So hopefully, you know, uh, people can get the message and we can all jump on board. But I really wanted to bring that piece today because it's just been, it's been relentless on us out here this year and uh, just really a nightmare. And so it's so important to be prepared any time of the year. You know, you just never know what's coming next. All right, let's go ahead and get into some Dark Days in Denver adventure. Last week, Erica, she created this whole mess and, you know, uh, really liked uh, how Star's character was like, no, come on, Mom, we got to go. And then she's like, all right, whatever, Mom, go go do what you're going to do. So uh, this huge conflict happened. And today we're going to slow it down a little Dexter is headed on out to the homesteads and we're going to see like how are they surviving out on these homesteads? What are they doing out there? And I really wanted to bring that piece into this book because um, that's, you know, the prepared community is knowing how to do these things. So today I'm absolutely honored to have Jane Austen or Survivor Jane with us and she is going to talk about the ins and outs of raising goats 
and uh, what that really looks like, what that really entails. I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm not really a goat lover. My uh, in-laws had some meat goats and they were just mean as all get go. They were the big, big ones. They climbed out of everything. They picked on my son. They, they climbed on cars. You know, <laughs> I just hated these things. But Jane's going to talk to us about these, the littler ones, and you can milk them, and then you get all the protein and stuff. You know, I'm really, really kind of, I'm almost sold on getting some of these, these dairy goats when we go ahead and, uh, you know, have a permanent homesteading situation. So that, that, I'm thinking about that pretty seriously now that I've had this interview with Jane. There's a lot to research, and she wants you to know that. She's got some great resources for you. So without any further ado, let's just go ahead and get into the Dark, dark Days in Denver story jump into the interview with Jim. Chapter 10. Making his way home, Dexter walked hand in hand with Megan. Besides Johnny, she was his best friend. They talked candidly together, and he described life within the walls of the homesteads. The houses are located in small clusters with land that stretches for miles around them, Dexter explained. Maybe one day we could settle down someplace like that, Megan commented. Maybe, Dexter agreed. You don't sound too sure about that, Megan remarked. How long do you think it will take the feds to regroup? We have scouts out. You know they will too, he thought out loud. One day at a time, Dex. That's all we can be thankful for, Megan commented. He wrapped his arm around her, squeezing the young woman towards him. You got that right. Tomorrow is never guaranteed, Dexter agreed. Speaking of, do you have tower duty again tomorrow, she wondered. No, I've been invited back to the homesteads for outer perimeter patrol. That means fried chicken for lunch, he elated, rubbing his belly. Lucky, Megan told him. What's on your agenda, Dexter asked. I have the day off, but I'll probably go help your grandma at the school, she explained. But her mind wandered someplace else. Dexter? What, he asked. Will you be going out on the next scouting mission, or will you stay to guard the homesteads, she asked. I'll probably be going out. My skills are wasted on guard duty, but damn, the food is good, he thought out loud. They parted ways in front of the tents. Dexter thought about giving her a kiss, but he was concerned about messing up their friendship with relationship complications. He entered the tent. His family lay slumbering peacefully. He smiled at his mom passed out in a drunken stupor. She was bruised and snored loudly, something she did not usually do at all. He sank into his sleeping bag and fell asleep to the rhythm of her breathing. Dexter was up at first light. Trucker's wet tongue slid forcefully across his face. It's not time to get up yet, Trucker, he sleepily scolded the animal, but the dog persisted. Okay, okay, I'm up, Dexter told him. Trucker backed up and sat down as Dexter put his uniform on and laced up his boots. The rays of the rising sun were just illuminating the world outside the tent, as Dexter stepped out into the cool morning air. You ready, bro? Johnny asked. He was already outside waiting. All set, Dexter declared. It was a long hike to the outer border of the homesteader's property line. As they passed by the homes, Dexter noticed the morning activity was just beginning inside. In the nearby pasture, the mama goats were hard at work as well. Two more babies were born during the night. Dexter lingered for a moment watching their antics. They're cute, aren't they? A woman asked from inside the goat shelter. Yes, ma'am, they sure are, Dexter commented. She started to approach the fence line but hesitated when she saw Trucker there, standing vigilantly at Dexter's side. Don't worry, ma'am, he's friendly, Dexter assured her. Are you sure about that? She questioned him with a hint of an Australian accent. Honestly, he's not friendly, but he is well trained. You're safe, he assured her. Now that I'll believe, she told him closing the distance between the two of them. The babies won't have much time with Mama, she explained. Why not, Dexter wondered. We'll take them to the nursing house and bottle feed them. That way they'll be human friendly, and the mamas can be milked for us to make milk and cheese, she explained. Would you like to come and see? Maybe some other time, miss, he hesitated, realizing he hadn't gotten her name. Simpson, Audrey Simpson, she responded. Mrs. Simpson, Dexter finished, noticing her wedding ring. We're headed out to the border for patrol. Sounds like more fun than milking goats all morning, she commented. I guess it's all in the perspective, Dex replied. Take care, ma'am. Take care, mister, she responded, realizing she hadn't gotten his name either. 
Private case, and this is Corporal Johnson, Dexter informed her. You have a nice day, ma'am. Johnny and Dexter continued down the trail towards their assigned post. I think Kyle is making the moves on Star, Johnny commented. I think you're right, Dexter admitted. I'd like to say I don't like that dude, but I'd be lying. Plus, he sure did give Sean what he had coming last night. Did you see his eye when he got up on stage? Now that guy is a joke, and I've always thought so. He's lucky your father didn't rip his balls off, Johnny laughed. He'd heard the story about Vince ripping off a man's balls for thinking of raping his wife. Dexter chuckled at the reference. I wonder what he was doing there at all. I thought he left her to go play for the landowners and enjoy all the cushy perks, Johnny commented. I thought so too, bro, Dexter agreed. He was probably macking on one of those hot chicks that threw themselves at him and the landowner that married him dropped him like a rock. Probably. Who could blame him, though? I heard that chick he married fell out of the ugly tree and hit every branch all the way down, Johnny said, laughing hard. They met the men they were replacing and took their place patrolling the trail. Dexter watched the forest animals carrying on with their daily routines, but occasionally he would turn the scope around and watch the homesteaders as well. There were children helping their mother hang clothes on a line. The littlest girl had a step stool to boost her high enough to help. Their mother sang softly as the children tore back and forth, gathering additional items from the basket. I always wanted kids, Dexter admitted to Johnny. Not me. My dad was always too busy for me anyway, Johnny replied. Megan mentioned settling down someplace like this, Dexter told him. What's up with you two anyway, Johnny prodded. She's easy to talk to, Dexter told him. You two getting together, Johnny wondered? I don't know. I really don't want to mess up our friendship. Relationships can make things awkward, Dexter worried. That's true. What if it didn't work out and she's your adopted aunt for the rest of your life? Weird, bro, Johnny added. She's not blood, Johnny. You know that, Dexter told him. Neither is Star, Johnny added. Yeah, but Star is my sister. I can hardly remember life without her. I just met Megan a year ago when she isn't even officially adopted. And now none of that really matters anyhow, Dexter defended. True, Johnny agreed. She's a cool girl, too. You're right. She is easy to talk to, Johnny admitted. What do you know about it, Dex asked. Don't get all jealous. I do share a tent with the woman, Johnny reminded him, chuckling at his defensive posture. Dexter pulled his eye away from the scope and scowled at Johnny. Don't get in a ruffle, bro. I wouldn't go there. I know you like her, Johnny affirmed. Dexter returned his eye to the scope. The morning passed into afternoon, and Audrey appeared with a man in a basket. Hello, she announced as she approached. This is my husband, Rylan. Johnny and Dexter shook hands with the man and introduced themselves. How you guys getting along today, he asked in a Midwestern accent. His hair was short and gray, and his nose dominated his face. Just fine, sir. All quiet here, Dexter confirmed. Andrea sent this out for you two boys, Audrey announced, handing Dexter the basket. She sure does appreciate what you did yesterday. I imagine any mother would, Dexter responded. I guess you're right, Audrey replied, chuckling a little at his candid response. Do you have any children, Dexter asked. Audrey looked to the ground and scowled. Ryland answered quickly. No, we were waiting until the time was right, and then... He hesitated. Well, we weren't landowners. Neither was I, Dexter replied honestly. It's such a beautiful day, isn't it? And your chicken is getting cold, Audrey broke in, quickly changing the subject. Yes, ma'am, it is, Johnny said, aiding her attempt. Dexter looked down at the basket in his hand and unwrapped the cloth. The savory smell of fried chicken wafted through the air. There were fresh biscuits on the side. Thanks, it smells wonderful, Dex told her. Take care of yourself, Rylan replied as they left. Surviving the planetary changes alone is not going to be easy for an individual, for a family, for a society. And then the societal changes that are going to happen on top of that because of these planetary changes that are happening are going to be, you know, crazy. Who knows what they will do in emergency times? You know, lots of scary things happen in emergency times. They make emergency actions and 
before we know it, we see soldiers standing around on the border. And and not that I'm not a fan of having our soldiers there, but how long are they going to be there? You know, we do not want uh, a martial law type situation that we're all just going to get used to because we needed to implement that in an emergency situation. So that's really like a big warning that I, I try to emphasize in my book is so much stuff happens in this story because they needed to do it to prevent huge catastrophe. And I wanted to really present both sides because a lot of times I don't really believe people are evil. And a lot of times people do things in the best interest thinking that is going to, you know, be the best solution. And, and they're trying to do the very best thing they can for everybody. And their, their intentions are not evil. But things can come from those decisions. And how they, infect, how they affect the individual can be really, really bad compared to the point that they had in mind. So it can turn into this evil thing. So it's just, you know, I don't know that there's any kind of solution. It's really just writing about it is what it is. And that's why I just caution taking too much action in an emergency situation. So one of the ways that people are surviving and thriving in this new altered or on this new altered planet is by raising goats. And today I have Jane Austen or Survivor Jane back with us. She was on season four and now she's joining us for season five. So, I, you know, I'm completely honored. Survivor Jane is the author of Where There Is No Cosmetic Counter, How Not to Look Like a Zombie Even After the End of the World. Great book, you know, really um, aimed at the females out there on, you know, how to keep yourself looking great even when stuff hits the fan. So like so many women, Jane was a self-professed, oblivious to what was going on around me, city girl. She was clueless about politics, the economy, and the ever-changing weather patterns around her. It wasn't until she personally experienced a life-threatening assault at gunpoint, lived through several violent hurricanes, and watched as her 401k dwindled down to next to nothing that her eyes began to open to what was going on around her. In 2008, she took a huge leap of faith quit her corporate job, sold her home for next to nothing, cashed in her 401k, which is even more next to nothing, and moved to Western North Carolina to learn to live a more self-sustaining and self-reliant lifestyle. Giving up the life of eating at a different restaurant each night and having her nails and hair done every two weeks, she began to research how to prepare for uncertain times and still retain her girliness. While searching preparedness websites, she noticed that most were male-oriented. Frustrated at the need to research a word, phrase, or term that she didn't understand each time she went to one of these sites, it began to dawn on her that the reason she didn't understand these sites was because a lot of them were written by men. And, as we all know, men and women speak a different language and therefore process information differently. Jane decided then and there to make it her mission to educate others with an emphasis on women on how to better prepare themselves by creating the website SurvivorJane.com. Writing on a multitude of topics dealing with disaster survival and preparedness while interjecting bits and pieces of humor on personal experiences, discoveries, and her journey along the way. SurvivorJane.com also reaches preparedness-minded men who may have just begun their preparedness journey or have sent the women in their lives, albeit girlfriend, wife, daughters, mothers, aunts, or grandmothers to the site, and in the process was also helped to better understand preparedness from a woman's perspective. As an additional outreach, Jane uses social media networks. She is the creator of the internationally recognized hashtag, hashtag Prepper Talk, on Twitter and brings preparedness-minded people from all over the world together to discuss preparedness ideas, suggestions, and information with one another. It is currently the largest prepper community on Twitter. Jane has been featured on National Geographic's channel Doomsday Prepper, Season 4, and in Newsweek's special edition Off-Grid Prepper and Shooter magazine, Preparedness magazine. She is a contributing writer to National Geographic channel's Doomsday Prepper blog TV. Where there is no cosmetic counter and its first revision, Emergency Survival Hygiene, were written out of a need to bring some more awareness to one of the most overlooked areas in preparedness, personal hygiene, by showing easy ways to make survival personal hygiene products. After all, 
Infectious diseases are the number one cause of death worldwide. In her book, What Could Possibly Go Wrong? How to Go From Completely Clueless to Totally Prepared, she talks to the reader in easy-to-understand language about her personal experiences and what she has learned could go wrong around us and how we can better prepare ourselves and family for these uncertain times. If you would like to find out more about Jane, head on over to www.survivorjane.com. That's www.survivorjane.com. So let's go ahead and welcome Jane to the show. Today, I am honored to have Jane Austen, Survivor Jane, back on my show. Hi, Jane. How are you doing today? Hey, hi. Thank you for inviting me back. I'm excited to be back. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. I just, I can't wait till the day comes when we actually get to meet each other. It's coming up soon, I hope, next year. So uh, that'll be a lot of fun. We're looking forward to it, too. Don't be teasing me, though. Okay? Right? All these people like, oh, yeah, I will, I will, I will. You just need to get out of that place you're living and get over here to God's land. That's right. I'm one of those characters that actually follows through, though. So <laughs> I'll be there eventually. Yay. <laughs> So today in the podcast, we're talking about raising goats. So I have Dexter and Johnny, and they're going out to these homesteads, and they're just kind of conversating with this lady who's raising goats, and, you know, Dexter's pretty interested, and, you know, what's going on with this? How does this work? And I know that that's a big part of your homesteading life, so I wanted to have you on to talk about it. So why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself real, real quick to the audience, let them know who you are, where they can find you, and then we'll jump right in. Thank you. Well, for everybody who doesn't know, um, I'm Survivor Jane. Most people know me by Survivor Jane. They don't know who Jane Austen is. So I <laughs> kind of, because I'm on all these social media and because of the back doorways or whatever, you have to say who you are and you have to say. So most people have known me for years and years on Twitter and um, a Facebook page as Survivor Jane, but after the Doomsday Prepper series and they put my name and let God and everybody know who I am, I'm Jane Austen also, so I do hope that you'll uh, to look into Survivor Jane, my blog post, and um, I'm on all of the, uh, the social media uh, networks, which it's Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and what Google Plus and anything and everything. I've, I've got something out there, so whatever your cup of tea is or your your preferred poison, that's, you know, that's where you'll find me. Um, I love to socialize, and so I'd love for you all to just, uh, just uh, click that little bell and say hey so I can uh, say hey back. Nice, yeah. Um, it's always good to be able to connect. That's the one reason why I keep my social networks around, you know, because it's just so awesome to be able to connect with people across the whole globe. Yes. Um, it's really, really fun. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Yeah. So I always uh, get rewarded when I'm up, you know, at midnight and because then my friends in Australia are up and things like that. So <laughs> it's amazing. You know, way back when I had this, uh, um, I created the hashtag Prepper Talk um, right. on uh, Twitter. And we used to have a talk where we would go almost 24 seven because where the East Coast would leave off to the West Coast, then it would go on to international um uh, countries and it was just it's just amazing and that just grew and grew and grew um i i don't stay up till midnight anymore in fact i don't even think i can Sarah. i mean 10 <laughs> o'clock and it's like sorry i'm going to bed so <laughs> yeah i burn the midnight oil with my books you know because the kids you. go to bed and it's like okay it's time to actually get a lot of work done so yeah although that my kids are like well all you do is train and write anyway so <laughs> That's a lot of work, both of them, mental and physical, so. Right? Yep. So, Jane, today we're talking about goat farming. How did you and Rick first get into raising goats? Okay, well, we actually went in line, Sarah, with all of the research we did for um, – the homestead you know it was uh it wasn't just okay we're going to go and move and we're going to do this and that we we actually after we took that leap of faith where was a lot of planning before we actually made a commitment to anything um so we're not goat farmers per se i mean when i heard that you know i was reading you wanted me to talk about goats and uh, goat farming and it was like i for some reason i had a need to go get a staff so i could stand out there you know with <laughs> all of my goats so i don't really do that um we have dairy goats and the reason we have dairy goats is for milking and uh we actually people said well why goats 
you know, over cows. Cows give you lots and lots and lots of milk. And, you know, they do. But we were looking for a small footprint. And what that means is we were looking for um, a to keep everything kind of close-knit to the homestead. Everything was kind of like in a concentric circle, if you will. Um, and goats are um, browsers, which means they kind of nibble at this and they nibble at that. They might nibble at leaves. They might like to chew on berry bushes. They might want to, you know, they, they're browsers, whereby cows are grazers. You know, mm -hmm. you see cows out there and they graze. And so you need a lot more space, a bigger footprint, if you will, for cows, because they need to be pasteurized, not <laughs> pasteurized as in you cook them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pastures, they need to be in a pasture because of the fact that they need to be able to move around and eat and eat and eat and eat along like, uh, much like uh, horses do. Um, right. Where a goat, you can keep them close to home and they will kind of just nibble. No, I don't like the taste of that. And they'll eat something else. So that was a big factor in um, getting the goats. Um, another one was the amount of milk to the size of the goat. We actually um, decided on Nigerian dwarf dairy goats. Now they're small. And when I say small, I would say maybe anywhere from, oh, 70 to 100 pounds, maybe a little bit more, you know, okay. so they're, they're like a mid-sized dog. Yeah. And three milkers, which is three mama, mama goats milking, um, will give us about um, a gallon to a gallon and a half a day. So with that, that is more than enough for two people. Um, and so it was like, okay, they're good milkers. They're good. Um, they're very social. They are like little kids. And so um, that was just that perfect little fit for us. And, and plus, um, I wasn't used to being around animals. I'm a, I'm a one cat girl. And okay. to be around the, all these animals, I, I really didn't feel threatened with something that mm -hmm. I knew I could probably take. So we have um, here on our homestead, we have, um, gee, right now we have two bucks. And so for everybody that asks, well, do you even have to have a buck? Yeah, you do. You have to have them for about five minutes every year if you want <laughs> right. milk because mm -hmm. that's their purpose in life. And then so we have uh, we have a buck. And then we have a standby because you always want to have your redundancy because if heaven right. forbid something would happen to that one, then you wouldn't have uh, another buck. Then we have our milkers. We always have three girls going at the same time. And uh, I don't know if that kind of helps to understand how we we got into it or how we made our decision. But that was purely for the size, the footprint, and how much milk we could actually get. Yeah, that's awesome because, uh, you know, we actually had a cow. Uh, my mom had gotten this cow, and then she got a bull, got the cow impregnated, had a little baby cow, and, you know, bottle fed it and everything. So she loved this cow, um, but it ended up going out to pasture for a while because it's just you can't have just one cow, yeah, you know, because yeah. they get so lonely. They was busting out of fences trying to get, yeah. And uh, the, the thing ended up weighing like 2,500 pounds. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, right. It was like this gigantic cow because it was out in pasture and my neighbors are feeding the heck out of it and everything. And we had to move her. And you want to talk about intimidating to move an animal that big. And the expense uh, and how, yeah. I mean, you know, if they're afraid, they're nervous. I mean, yeah. you have to take these things into consideration. Can you handle the animal that you have? Exactly. And I will say that we put collars on all of ours, like little doggy collars you know so mm -hmm. just in case we can grab hold of it and we can kind of say no we're going this way or we can put a leash on it and walk it out you know where we want it to go or whatever and it's not yeah. like I said it's almost like taking a teenager you can tackle them if you need to you know so <laughs> yep. yeah you ain't <laughs> so, tackling that cow you know she's yeah. just gonna mow no, you no, over she's gonna, yeah I was if, like, if she know... gets nervous yep Yep. I was like, you know, I don't think that cows is like really right for me, mom. You know, yeah. like, let's just put and her in the freezer. And this is not working. They're sweet, yeah. but you have to understand what they're actually, what their purpose is. You know, you yeah. don't want a feeding machine. You don't want to spend all your time, energy moving a cow from place to place when you can have goats that kind of pretty well stay close to home and can 
eat whatever they want. Now, our goats, they love this time of year, Sarah, because it's fall and the leaves are falling. They get crunchy and they're like mm -hmm. potato chips to these things. I mean, they just eat and eat and eat and eat. They love crunchy oak leaves. Then you don't have to rake the leaves, too. No, you don't. Right? You Perfect. don't. Because, they're yeah, they just they take care of it. So what does the typical day on a goat farm look like? Well, well I shouldn't first we got to meet them. Yeah, I mean, first we got to yeah. feed them. I mean, we definitely, but with it, the milking, it's not just, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to take my pan and I'm going to put it under the goat and I'm going to try to milk it. it there's a, there is an art to it. And mm -hmm. just like we women, the teats on goats are different sizes, doggone it. So you might have a, a small teat the size of the size of a thumb, and you might have another teat that's the size of a pinky finger. I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? Right. And so you have to make sure that you have very stable equipment before you even go out. So I have to make sure all my goat uh, equipment is clean. Then I go out. I have to clean the goat first. You have to make sure that her teats are clean. You have to wipe her all down because goats, what do they do? They lay out there in the straw and the, the dirt and they chew and they just get all dirty up underneath. So you don't want that in your milk. Okay. So you have to you have to clean all that. You have to make sure that everything is sanitized. I actually wear gloves because I want to make sure that my hands are clean also. And uh, so that we milk our goat. We give them a little bit of, um, just a little bit of those, um, oh, I don't know, grains or whatever. Let them eat while you're milking because that just kind of relaxes them and it keeps them, uh, keeps them occupied, if you will. Because if not, uh -huh. they get a little testy and they'll start kicking. And once you put your foot in the milk, okay, you've just lost a whole container mm -hmm. of milk. So you want to be really cautious like that. Um, then we let them out, and um, we're really big on keeping the stalls clean. We just think that that's good health-wise for the goats. It's good health-wise for us, and so that means getting in there. It is amazing how much poop goats will poop out <laughs> while they're sleeping. I mean, what the luxury right. of being able to just not even get up and move. They just lay there and poop, and oh so I've God. got benches full of poop that I got to clean up and of course it makes great fertilizer which is yeah, I was you know, gonna say it's thing. great fertilizer yep. yep so I just scrape it up and we throw it all out into the garden um we also have to check which people don't think about but we have to check their their hoofs we have to make sure that their nails are cut or that they don't have anything stuck in their feet so a okay. lot of times after that we've got to and you think Do you actually the trim their hooves? Yes, we have to trim their hooves. Oh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, it's like uh, tackling a teenager sometime because yeah. nobody wants their paw or their leg held up. So we've got to clip their nails. We've got to check their teeth. We've got to check their ears. And just we want to make sure that they are pretty well healthy for the day before we even let them out so that there's not any issues that come you know, back to us uh, later right. on in the day. And then the rest of it is we're off to our regular homestead chores of all the other animals that we have to take care of. How do you do, how, how are you trimming their nails? Like with a file or? Uh... No, actually it's very, very intimidating. I mean, very intimidating. It looks like a warp side, uh, it looks like warped, um, kitchen scissors if you will they kind of are at angles and so you have got to be so careful that you don't cut into what would be considered our wick you know so they yeah. bleed so you have got to and of course they're pulling and they're uh -huh. we don't necessarily tie ours down we'll put them sometime we'll put them in our, our milk station that has their neck but right. um we kind of just have to lean on them and hold their they're, they don't understand we're doing this for their good. They think, okay. okay, you're attacking me or you're doing something. But if not, it's, it's almost like you've seen those pictures on, oh, I don't know, the internets or whatever, where people have these really long ghastly nails, you know, that they've just let grow and right. grow and they turn and twist. Well, the same thing happens with goats. You know, they can get some very deformed um goat hoofs so you have to cut that portion off flat because when they're out in the grass or out in the, the uh, field area they can't wear them down so you've got to be able to clip them so that it keeps them a nice flat so they don't twist their ankles or, or fall or hurt yourself 
we have a ton of shale rock and a lot of rock mountainous stuff out here. I wonder if that's why I don't know about it as much because that rock really does a number on. Uh, Honestly, that's probably. Yep. It's not that it's not. It's not that it's the, the nails are really, really, really hard. It's that there's no grinding down, and that that could be. Yeah, because we have really, really rocky soil out here. It's yep. uh, clay and shale and stuff like that. And like even my dogs, because they tear across the hill so much, I barely have to trim their nails ever. So um, that maybe that's sounds why. like yeah. that's the answer. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's really cool. I was like, I did not know that you would, act, but it makes sense. I mean, you got to do it to horses. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, interesting. So um, when you have the, so obviously milk has to come from a female that just had a baby. So how does all of that work? Well, once we know that we need one buck and we need a, a mama to be able to have the milk, because so many people buy a, a female goat thinking that they're going to have milk. And it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, you got to no. have something start this thing. And the right. starting is of the babies. And so we will actually, we've learned to plan these things now. Um there was one time that I was feeding 12 babies at the same time oh, okay. um, yeah. every morning, and that was a challenge. Um, but we will keep the babies. We actually have three mamas, um, or we usually have three, yeah, I guess pre-mamas that will give birth and uh, so that we can have the babies. Now, I don't know. We have one mama that, doggone it, usually they will give uh, one to two babies. Um, we have had some that have given all the way up to five babies. Some have wow. given seven babies. And so Whoa. you don't know what you're going to get. It's like a box of chocolates, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. wow. And you just have to wait and wait, um, until they give birth to see exactly, you know, what you're going to get. But we keep the babies with the mama for three days. And the reason we do that is because the mama gives what's called a clostrum. And it's a, a superpower milk, if you will, that really helps the babies with their digestive system, gives them that nutrition that they need. Um, then after the three days, we take them. And um, that's when we start giving them the milk. Now they only take now if you uh, babies. If you ever watch them, they go up and they do these little nibble things on the teats. You know, it's just right. a little drink, little drink, little drink, little drink. So you're not going to feed a baby an eight ounce bottle when that's almost as big as they are. You have to feed them three to four times a day in little increments. So Gosh. that's consuming when you have things that you're doing all all day. Anyhow, you have to stop and you have to make sure that you're timing those out there at least, you know, once in the morning, mid morning, afternoon and evening before they go to bed. So it's it is a it's an investment and we don't do it because we want to keep the babies because we don't we actually will sell the babies but we do that because we want to socialize them so many times people have come to see a goat as a prospective buyer and they're like oh my gosh i mean our babies will jump on you they love to be touched they love to be <laughs> um held they love to you know because they have been socialized a lot of people will just continue to keep the babies on the teat and then um once a prospective buyer comes, they're afraid. They're afraid of the humans because they've been with their moms all this time. And yeah. we like and prefer a social goat more than we do just because they're they're part of our animal family, if you will. So we mm -hmm. try to do, you know, the best we can. Now, another thing is that we do, and it's the hardest thing that we do, bar none, on our um, homestead in is we actually burn the horns of the babies that we are sick for three days before and six, uh, three days after because and the whole the whole procedure takes maybe five ten seconds that's uh -huh. it that's all it takes but it's just that putting that hot iron on those babies and afterwards they're just out running around and everything we're still sick about it you know <laughs> right? I mean, they, they do fine but it's us because we just hate to do it but because of the fact that there's so much danger as far as them getting their horns caught in a fence or impaling each other or even accidentally impaling um, a human I mean they are right at that uh, leg um, where the the vein go or the artery goes down that if they was to get 
uh, gouge your leg, I mean, you could bleed out before you could even get help. So yeah. we've just found it easier and healthier for our babies to go ahead and do that. So that's another thing you need to consider if you're you're going to get goats. Are you going to let their horns? And I've been rammed by a buck with horns. And I'll tell you what, that's like somebody taking a car and running it into the back of your legs mm -hmm. at 100 to 150 pounds. I mean, it is unbelievably painful. And that's not even the point. That's just the, the round portion of it. So we have to do that too um, when they're babies. So that's just part of that, you know, not so good part about it. Yeah, we just took out a bunch of ducks because uh, I raised Muscovy ducks and... Uh... I had one, I have one male. Well, I had don't haven't killed them all yet, and luckily he evaded the uh, the chopping block <laughs> the last time we went through them. Because I'm it's like, man, funny. this yeah. is my right. This is my one guy. I'm like trying to find him a home. Who needs a male? Take him, please. <laughs> and you know what? It's sad, but a lot of people yeah. they're not interested. They're not yep. interested in a male. It's good for one thing, and that's, you know, that's it. So, yep. yeah, it's, it's frustrating, and that goes for any animal that you get. You know, you have to consider, okay, you know, the in the animal kingdom, the women are prized, you know, it's for true. their their offspring. It's true, because I have a bunch of females. They all lay eggs and everything. I have my breeding pair, and there's a male that's with them already that's not related. I can't put their son in there with yeah, them, you know. Yeah, you gotta so be, he's going to have to go. We don't want any yep. of those uh um, <laughs> no. Or whatever you call them. Right? <laughs> yeah, we yeah. want the tree to go straight, not over, all over the place. So, yeah, it is difficult, you know, and my husband's always like, oh, you're just putting human emotions into the animals. Just stop it. You're just it's putting hard. human emotions. It's it hard. It is. It's it hard is. to separate sometimes. Yep. So, but, you know, that's what we do. Then what's what you got to do what you got to do. You do. So when you're um, feeding from the bottle, so they don't drink all the milk then, obviously, that mama's producing. You just take a small amount of that milk and separate that out for the babies to go into the bottle and feed them. That's exactly what I do. I heat it up to about 104, 108. That's usually about mama's temperature. Okay. And we'll just give them maybe an ounce to two. Okay. You no, know, not that much at all. And they will... They will let you know. And you know what? Another thing that I found out is with our goats, um, because they're Nigerian, they're smaller. I use puppy little bottles. I use because oh, gotcha. the nipples for other goats are so big that it's like cramming this big thing in their mouth and they just <laughs> don't understand it. Yeah. Um, so I have found that puppy bottles work so much better for the babies. Nice. Yeah, that makes sense. They're just like, whoa, what do I do with this thing? <laughs> yep. Okay, lady. <laughs> So I know you use the milk like crazy. So what are some of the examples of products that you're making on, you know, at your homestead from your goat milk? I call it moving the milk. It's like, moving what are you going to do milk. today? Yep. I am moving the milk. I move it to ice cream. I make homemade. And it is the most creamiest, richest ice cream. I mean, it is it's unbelievable. I make yogurt. And the secret to making yogurt, I mean, I tried, Sarah, anything and everything to make yogurt, and it was just a fail all the time. It was just always water, like thick right. water, if you will. I found this cylinder, small, um, cylinder Coleman thermos. You know, it's one of those tall, like, I would say maybe um, maybe six inches, inches in diameter, if that. Uh -huh. I put a little bit of water in it, about 125, just out of the sink, warm water. Right. And um, when I, as I heat my, my yogurt up, I pour it into the, um, my, I just, I do pints or quarts, you know, so I just do smaller ones. But when I put it in the, um, when I put it in the Coleman and I shut it up, it is done in six to eight hours. And I mean, mm. it is done as an, it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, where I've tried the, um, I've tried the cookers and I've tried bean bags and I've tried all kinds of stuff, but, um, uh, just like, no, I, I can't even, I can't, <laughs> it's not working. It's a waste of it, but I make cheesecake. I make cheddar cheese with the cheese press. I make mozzarella cheese. Um, I make cream cheese. I mean, cheese are me when I'm moving the milk, you have to, yeah. be, but you know, and I'll tell you what, it's just hands down completely different than what it is when you buy it in the store. I mean, it is unbelievable how 
great it is. In fact, I'm really contemplating this year writing a cookbook, recipe book, if you will, not cookbook, a recipe of homestead things that I do actually um, here on the um, the homestead just to show, you know, it's not as intimidating as, as what it you seems. Think. Once yeah. you get to do it, yeah, but at first not being able to cook or anything, it was like, uh, I don't think I can do all this. But well, you do. Right. You know what? Yeah. It, when when a gallon to a gallon and a half starts coming in, um, definitely you, you learn to do these things, and you learn to do it well if you want to eat it. Right, yeah, because you can't watch it go to waste. It's just horrible. I mean, uh, we've gotten – it was kind of weird for us at first eating um, duck eggs, you know. but Oh, yeah. You know, because the shells are a lot harder. They're a little bit more mucusy, like inside. Yep. The yolks stiffer, you know. But man, I'm telling you, they make some great cakes and just batters, like you wouldn't believe. Because and now we they even have do them a scrambled. different. I've learned that they have a different protein than what the the regular mm -hmm. chicken and eggs have. You know, so sure. that. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. So that's just better for your muscles and everything. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah, now I, I got people to... at my gym like, ooh, I'll take some duck eggs, oh, more yeah, protein. I, yes, yeah. yep, they, they love it. Now, I'm the only one in the whole world, I'll tell you, um, that I know of so far that is allergic to duck eggs. I mean, who right. is allergic That's to right. duck eggs? But yeah. for some reason, I am because of that protein. For some reason, my body doesn't digest it. Um, everybody met, else is like, oh, I love them. Give them to me and da, da, da. But uh -huh. me, it's just like as soon as I eat them, it's like, oh, I just cannot. Uh, my stomach just doesn't take them. So um, uh, that's, that's why, you know, reason why we got chickens, because Rick did not want chickens oh, no matter what. The destroyers is what he calls them. Oh, but They are, um, too. They yep, are. They're they destructive. Are. I wanted to add a little bit, you know, I forgot to tell you, um, we had a baby this last year um, at Christmas time, and so we named it Rudolph, and it was a runt. I mean, it, we didn't think it was going to last the night, um, so I brought it inside, and we started taking care of it and bottle feeding it and whatever. We actually potty trained it. Now, oh, okay. It was the cutest thing, and we had him in the house for quite a while. In fact, Rick has a video on his Secret Garden of Survival um, website on how to train a baby goat uh -huh. and uh, potty train it. And it's just the cutest little thing. He would, I had a little box and he would go into the potty, um, the little, you know, the pee pads that they have for, for puppies. Right. Well, I would put one in there and every time they had to go and after a while, he just got used to it. Now, the only reason the goat, except for that he was getting bigger, is that my cat would jump up on the furniture and he thought he could do that too and so he would jump up and it felt so squishy like the potty patty that he would try to pee uh, on my sofa and it's like mm -hmm. you know what this is the end of your home yep. stay but it is adorable and it's just to show how smart these animals actually are you know so many people think oh it's just an animal no they're actually social animals and they actually can learn and Nigerians are very, very smart. Yeah, they're cute as all get go too. Oh, they are. Those ones. So when you're making your yogurt, do you actually can do you like do the vanilla yogurt or do you just make it plain and then flavor it afterwards? I just I just make mine plain. I don't add anything to it. It is a basic yogurt. And then okay. um, because of the fact that uh, we are blessed with a garden and I have yeah. so much as far as preservatives of any type of fruit that we just Fair add enough. a tablespoon mm -hmm. yeah, of that and there you go. Yeah, you just put in your, your little preservatives, mix it up, and away you go. And yeah, then you can you put go, that yeah. on top of ice cream and everything, too, oh, your cheesecake, yeah. all that. Yes, yep. and I do. I use everything. I have to, or I would just back up. And that's not oh, what food yeah. stores are supposed to be. You're supposed to be no. using them. Yeah, it would break your freaking heart, too, all that work that you put into there to just watch it go bad. No. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sadly, there's a lot of people that do that. They would rather just prize what they have than actually eat. And that's really important to use the milk. Don't pour it out. I actually yeah, no. use, the, when I'm making the cheese, I use the whey from my mozzarella cheese um, to feed the chickens and the, um, the ducks. So, yeah. you know, uh, there's all this is not a waste. Everything can be used. Yeah, and you guys don't have pigs, right? No, oh, we don't. Uh -uh. Okay. I'd like to get pigs. Yeah, that's my next. But right now. Because yeah. they love the dairy. Oh, my goodness. The, yeah. They will just mow that dairy up. They're, <laughs> they love it. So, yeah, they're little. Um, they eat everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. So, I enjoyed raising the, raising the pigs. 
So how about the meat? Um, probably not eating it from the dairy cow or from the dairy goat, right? No, yeah. even if something happened to it, Jesus, I just, I, right now it, they're not meat goats and we specifically did not want meat goats. We were just looking for dairy. Um, there are lots of brands, brands, is that what you call them? Uh, types or yeah, styles? Or, uh, <laughs> there uh, are lots of goats out there that are actually for meat and they're bigger and yeah, um, and not as sociable as the um, the ones that the you dairy have. goats. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. but no, we specifically um, we have rabbits and we have chickens and we have ducks mm. for the meat and um, uh, and for eggs too, except for the rabbits. The rabbits don't give eggs, but you know, but uh, that's our meat. It's good fertilizer, and, uh, though. Yeah, excellent that. But uh, now we just wanted the milk for the the um, producing, and we went the alternative route, which was the uh, rabbits and chickens and ducks for the meat. I mean, for yeah, for the meat and yep. um, dairy for the goats. Um, if you had the two, though, I mean, it could be an option, right? Yeah, I mean, so could the old goat here. I mean, he looks yep. he's looking pretty good here. I know what I feed him, so <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like I know, I know exactly what they do. Right? <laughs> Perfect. That's so true. Well, dude, I think that pretty much covers it. Do you think uh, is there anything else you can think of that would be important to tell the audience before they kind of, you know, you know um, kind Honestly, of start dabbling? I would say please do your research. It's not mm -hmm. like, you know, so many people, they get a pet, whether it's a hamster or whether yeah. it's a dog or whether it's a cat or whatever, and they don't thoroughly do their investigation or research and find out that, oh, I didn't know you had to do this or I didn't. We have to give our, our goat shots. We have to make sure that they are up on vaccination. So that means you've got to take a needle and you've got to stick it into that goat. Right. And, you know, that's that's a hard thing to do. Another thing is I had to actually go in and birth a baby because she, the mother couldn't get it out. Now, that yep. in itself was very well worth videoing because it was a it was a comedy of errors. You know, at the time <laughs> right. it wasn't very funny, but it was like. We got to go in there and get that baby out. I didn't even know what I was going in there for, Sarah. I just put my arm in there. I didn't know if I was pulling out her tonsils or if I was going to get a baby. <laughs> I didn't feel anything that felt right. like a baby by any means. <laughs> but we were able to birth it. It, it uh, survived. And, you know, it was so rewarding. But at the time, you don't just necessarily let the animal do what they have to do i mean it's almost like we as humans there's times where things happen and the baby could be breached the baby could be tangled the baby could be you know so you have to think about those things that it's not just necessarily buying a goat and everything's going to be happy happy joy joy and you're just right. going to get this milk there are times where things happen um they they get injured they pound into each other so there's a lot of things that you need to think about along with you know you want this for milk and you want where you're going to put it and all this other stuff so I hope I was able to open everybody's eyes to you know it's not just a matter of a purchase it's a matter of an investment because that's what goats are right that's so true um we raised some uh, meat goats and I you know I didn't really get along with the goats very well so yeah. I was like well, I don't I know about that. If I knew you were going to eat me, I don't think I would be your friend either. <laughs> right? Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're like, attack my son. We're like, always yep. picking on the kids and stuff. Yep. I'm like, nope. But then yep. I really like the little guys. You know, they're a lot cuter. So that's they're something sweet. that I, yeah, that I could actually venture into, I think, at my next, my next homestead. But yeah. Um, and it's good in the mountains. I mean, they eat, we've got poison oak going crazy around here. So, I mean, they're good on that aspect where they eat everything they eat everything yeah they right. do i mean it's not anything they will kind of taste and see what it is that they need but i mean some people think that you just put them out there and they're just going to eat all this no they're going <laughs> right. to actually browse and, and take what they want yeah fair enough it's not just like a, a mower out there bring right. it. there you go <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair enough. so all righty jane well thanks so much for joining me today i really appreciate your time and i hope that helped the audience out as far as like them deciding if this is something they want to pursue or not i hope so too and thank you so much for having me again thanks jane so much for coming on the show and talking to us about how to raise goats there's a lot of things in there you know like the burning of the horns and all that just things we didn't really think about so you know it's really important to do all of your homework before you invest your time and your money into any one of these projects you got to decide 
which one is going to give you the most bang for your buck when you go ahead and invest in it. So keep that in mind. Do your research and find out if raising goats might be right for you. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of area to do that. And uh, they have there's lots of great systems that you can read about in Rick Austin's books, The Secret Livestock Survival, Secret Garden of Survival, and um, Secret Greenhouse of Survival. Great books. I recommend that you get a hold of them because uh, Rick has some really awesome, awesome systems. And, uh, you know, Jane can verify that um, it, how their setup is there is just incredible. So you should check that out. And thanks, Jane, so much for coming on the show. I also want to give a shout out to my Patreon members and say thank you so much for all you guys do. I really appreciate your contribution to the show and your support in helping the show go on. So I really, really appreciate it. And I'll have some great goodies for you as always. And there's always new audio popping up over there. So make sure you check out your member page over on the site and uh, see if any new audio has popped up over there. So once again, thank you so much for your contribution. If you would like to become a contributor, head on over to www.patreon.com backslash changing earth. That's www.patreon.com backslash changing earth. Thank you so much for listening to the show today. I hope that you got a lot out of it because, you know, um, homesteading is one of the key areas and doesn't take much land to get started. So even if you're in an urban area or whatever, don't get discouraged because there's so many things that you can grow and uh, different animals that you can raise. If you research it, research, you know, what's allowed in your area and what's not. But, you know, it doesn't take much property. It doesn't take much area. Um, even if you're in an apartment, you can start doing something. You know, there's there's ways and means. You just got to research it and find out. And, you know, every bit of food and whatnot that you can raise yourself is so rewarding. You know right where it came from. You know, you know exactly what was put into it to grow it and everything. It tastes so much better. So it's definitely, even if you're just experimenting with the project so that if something did happen, you know you could go out there into the world and actually do it. You know, I really suggest it. It's a very rewarding process. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the story and we will see you next week. Until then, remember, dream, survive, thrive. Thank you for joining Sarah for this episode of the Changing Earth Podcast. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Day After Disaster, Without Land, The Walls of Freedom, Battle for the South, and Dark Days in Denver at www.authorsarahfhathaway.com. If you love Sarah's books and this podcast, please head over to Amazon or iTunes and let everyone know by leaving a review. 